Is it a Batman film? No. Is it a Superman movie? No. Is it a superhero buddy team up? No, not really. Then just what the hell is Batman v Superman? Zack Snyder's Man of Steel was released in 2013 and it was a pretty decent sized hit, so almost immediately a follow up was announced. It wasn't to be Man of Steel 2, but instead would be a film to lay the groundwork for a Marvel style team up in the vein of 2012's mega hit The Avengers, but without all the tedious bit of building up the characters in solo movies. It's like getting an exciting new video game and then using a cheat code just to skip to the last boss. Zack Snyder is not a person you could ever accuse of lacking ambition. He publicly announced the title almost before there was a script, but we won't let that trifling detail get in the way. He was making Batman v Superman. Man of Steel's reception was mostly positive, though many people seem to have issues with how Superman dealt with Zod, and the collateral damage that a lot of people, only half jokingly, blamed on Superman. You can see our Man of Steel review here. So Zack Snyder, rather than listening to what rankled audiences, ignored them and just doubled down on pretty much everything that was disliked about Man of Steel. Batman v Superman, often abbreviated to BVS, though why stop there, why not just call it BS? Dear Blade. Goes even darker than Man of Steel, offering up a film that has about a joke and a half across the entire film, and not a very good one. It's a fake. The real one was sold in 98 on the black market. Hangs over the bed of the Sultan of Hajar. <laughs> if there is a joke, it's on the level of the scripted banter you'd find in the Academy Awards ceremony, where only one of the presenters is drunk, but not drunk enough, and the other one is legally blind, doesn't have their contacts, and is too vain to wear spectacles. When Batman v Superman appeared in cinemas, it was a decent sized hit, though it was criticised for, well, everything. A common thread was that even at around two and a half hours, it felt disjointed and incoherent. I just wish it was more simple. An ultimate edition running three hours quickly became the definitive version of the movie, as extra scenes made the movie definitively incoherent and ultimately disjointed. Well done, everybody. Take a bucket of piss and call it Granny's peach tea. The ultimate edition at least makes it possible to understand, well, perhaps not what was actually going on, but what the filmmakers intended you to think was going on. It's a bit like expecting to make a cake from raw ingredients with only a photo of the end product to guide you in lieu of a recipe. The actual plot is fairly simple once you strip away the layers of Snyder angst, darkness and over-the-top characterizations. Next time they shine your light in the sky, don't go to it. The bat is dead. Bury it. Consider this mercy. Superman is being set up as some person that the government, and by extension, the people, can't control and is somehow responsible for various atrocities. Set up by whom? Lex Luthor, Superman's traditional nemesis, introduced here as an increasingly unbalanced tech billionaire played by Jesse Eisenberg, who once played a tech billionaire in a movie. So that's some imaginative casting there, folks. Luthor's plan involved prodding Batman into believing Superman is a menace to be dealt with, which apparently wasn't too hard to do. Luthor plans for Superman or Batman to kill the other, and then for some reason also creates a Kryptonian monster clone from Zod's dead body to, I don't know, I guess deal with the survivor. But in reality, it just brings them together. I love bringing people together. How are we? Lex. Ben Affleck is the new Batman, and he's pretty good as a damaged middle-aged Batman. A little less of a philosopher than Christian Bale's Batman, but now with a more sarcastic Alfred in the form of Jeremy Irons. Bruce Wayne's enthusiasm for bumping off Kal-El comes from Superman and Zod's fight, which leveled Metropolis in Man of Steel, which now also apparently leveled Gotham City, now right next door. Superman, who has what seems like five lines of dialogue in the entire film, is almost a guest in someone else's movie, wasting Henry Cavill. Amy Adams, the only available actor with enough alliteration in her name to convincingly play Lois Lane, does some journalism to prove that Superman was framed, but also blurts out Superman's secret identity at the drop of a hat in front of random civilians. Daily Planet. Sure thing, lady. Lois? Hey, the meter's running. You still want the cab, lady? I have to go to Gotham to convince him to help me. Clark. Holy shit, Clark Kent and Superman. I gotta Instagram this. No one stays good in this world. Now, there's a reporter I would not trust to protect the identity of their sources. Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor is... something. 
If you had to guess what the single most unpopular element of this film, it's Lex Luthor and how he's written and then how he's acted. It's not that he's just evil, that's his job after all, but he's intensely irritating. You don't hate him because he's trying to kill Superman and Batman. You hate him because he's such an annoying pain in the ass. It's like being stuck in an elevator with three teenagers trying to take selfies. Superman, yeah, but there are, uh, there are more of them. The metahuman thesis. Yes, the metahuman thesis. The red capes are coming. The bittersweet pain among men is having knowledge with no power because, because that's paradoxical and um, <laughs> thank you for coming. There's a big fight that seems to be solved by Batman and Superman both having a mother named Martha. Save Martha! That's like if World War II ended abruptly simply because Germany and Russia both realised they really liked Poland. Then Lex's monster clone comes along to screw up the brofest and all of a sudden Wonder Woman appears. Gal Gadot instantly sweeps away the wreckage of several failed attempts to bring Wonder Woman back to life and makes the role her own. Despite appearing in only a few scenes, she's easily the character who's most recognisable as her iconic character. Superman and Clark spend a big part of the movie in a sulky funk, while Bruce Wayne and Batman spend the rest of the movie in a funky sulk. Wonder Woman just gets on with the job and gets all those echoey yells while exerting. The film can't get right motivations in a way that makes any sense. Namely, why do the two heroes have to fight each other? This movie came out only weeks before Marvel did it right in Captain America Civil War. The pleasure. Ow! Wow! That is a good grip! You should not pick a fight with this person. BVS does have some stuff in its favour. It's visually splendid to look at. Snyder knows how to paint a picture. The oh-so-dark design works as it was intended, even if the actual original intention was flawed. It's like filling a blimp with hydrogen and thinking, well, that's one good-looking blimp. Yeah, don't worry about the hydrogen. They didn't explode during testing, so I'm certain the Hindenburg was just a statistical outlier. Bruce Wayne is suitably down in the dumps, but so is Clark Kent. No one in this universe seems to be all that happy, and no one in this universe seems to want Batman or Superman around. After this film, that included moviegoers. One highlight is the soundtrack by Hans Zimmer and Junkie XL. It's really very good. It's just a pity about the rest of the film. <sighs> Superman dies at the end. But even then, there's an ever so slight tease that maybe the end is not the end. I arranged for you to get transferred to Arkham Asylum in Gotham. I still have some friends there. They're expecting you. Alfred Pennyworth is nominally Bruce Wayne's butler, but also his technical engineer and chief of manufacturing. Of course, an interesting fact I've just made up is most of the Batcave's floor space is actually given over to Alfred's side hustle, his artisanal whiskey distillery. Batman vs Superman was planned as the start of a new franchise to both echo and rival Marvel with their never-ending slate of superhero movies, each apparently making more money than any DC release. Miss Lane. Jimmy Olsen, photographer. Oh look, Jimmy Olsen. Uh, oh, never mind. But in such a nonsensical three-hour moke fest, more miserable than a Star Wars fan in 2020, the inherent lightness in almost every successful superhero movie has is totally missing. With the darkness hanging around like an annoying aunt who won't go home. Also, Auntie Beryl, if you're watching this, it's getting late. Ah, no, no, I have an early meeting to go to. Bruce Wayne meets Clark Kent. I love it. I love bringing people together. Batman v Superman is a film that has a business imperative that was fairly strong for Warner Brothers, getting to the team-up films as soon as possible, since they were likely to generate more interest than the solo film. I've killed things from other worlds before. She with you? I thought she was with you. Just as putting windows in a fallout shelter to let in natural light might sound like a good idea. Instead, BVS flushed a lot of goodwill down the toilet and the cops weren't even knocking on the door. BVS didn't mark the end of the DCEU, but it was a gut shot that would take a while for DC to recover from. These characters would next team up in Justice League, but next up it was the villains turn to team up in Suicide Squad. Oh man. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. And I am... <laughs> No, I, um, no, what am I? I, what was I saying? No.